So what we're going to do, I've got a quite a long introduction, um, which I think is important to establish or at least to remind ourselves of um, some of the mechanisms, physiological mechanisms of, of cross hearing. Um, in other words, the, uh, the phenomenon that leads to the need for, for masking. So um, with, with that uh, basis established, I'll then just go on to, to talk about um, you know, masking in the auditory brainstem response, both on, from a theoretical perspective and um, with, with use of a, a case study example. And um, many of you may also uh, be interested not just in the auditory brainstem response, but also other types of evoked potential such as the um, ASSR, the auditory steady state response, and the cortical evoked potential as well. So whilst it's not the focus of um, today's talk, I'll just in closing um, mention some differences in, in um, procedures for the uh, ABR and those other types, the ASSR and the, and the corticals. So we talked about effective masker level, that's the point at which we first introduce um, the masking signal. But I want to introduce a new term which is the relative masker level. That's the point at which the, the non-test ear no longer uh, is able to respond in any way to um, to the to the mass uh, to the the, the crossheard sound. So just going back just one moment to the previous slide, what when we um, when we measure this masking function in pure tone audiometry, it's a relatively uh, in terms of time penalties, it's a relatively low time penalty to measure all these different points on the masking function, um, because each time you present a, a signal with the masker in place then it's just the, the time taken for the patient to respond with a button press. But in auditory brainstem response testing, each one of these points, an individual threshold, takes several minutes to compile enough um, uh, averages to, to decide whether there's a response present um, or, or absent. And so there's a huge time penalty. So what we need is, we need a way to, um, to, to predict um, where, we're, where we are on the masking chart. We need a way to jump to at least this point on the masking chart um, directly without having to measure it individually from one patient to the next as we do in pure tone audiometry. And um, this point on the masking chart here could be, de could be described or defined as the relative masker level, the point at which masking on the non-test ear was completely effective and there's no further change in the um, apparent threshold on the test ear. Here's that uh, concept explained a little more. So here we have again uh, the masker effective masker level, and um, so it's just beginning to 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 mask the signal. In other words, part of the um, part of the signal is masked out, but you can see that there's some activity that could still um, remain unmasked on the non-test ear, and so the patient might still respond, and that would be uh, the equivalent of being here on the masking function. So what we would do in this case is we'd turn the masker up a little bit, and here the masker is a bit more effective, and so the threshold and the uh, apparent threshold in the test ear increases a little bit, so here we would be um, around here on the masking function. And then um, here we reach the relative masker level, which is effectively here on the masker function. So in auditory uh, brainstem response testing, what we require, rather than measuring all these different points and, the, and to find the plateau even points beyond it where we turn the masker level up even more, what's required in auditory brainstem response testing is just to jump to this point um, uh, directly. So we need to know the relationship in that case between the masker level and the stimulus level um, in, in auditory brainstem response testing. And we have that information. So um, this is a study that um, was published some years ago by, um, by Guy Lightfoot and others. And um, Guy Lightfoot is a, a trusted and valued colleague and, um, uh, and, and collaborator with, um, with the Interacoustics family. Um, and he's also done a lot of work um, for the for the benefit of the, the uh, of the wider audience in the, um, in terms of uh, masking the auditory brainstem response, and this is one of those um, one of those pieces of work. And again, it's another study which I'll just unpack, which is somewhat ingenious in its simplicity of how they actually calculated that position on the masking function, that re relative masker level. And simply, what they did was as follows: they took 20 uh, normally hearing adults, and um, they uh, take, took uh, standard tr traditional um, ABR stimuli such as a click and um, frequency specific stimuli such as tone pips and they um, 
um, and, and they, they played uh, these sounds um, into the uh, test ear of these individuals both using uh, TDH headphones and also um, insert headphones uh, um, a comfortable volume of uh, 40 dB NHL and please note because we're talking about auditory brainstem response stimuli now then as you can see from the schematic down here then we might potentially have a very um, broad region of the basilar membrane responding particularly if it's a click it's a broadband sound but also um, of course even with um, relatively frequency specific stimuli like the tone pips then they'll still be because they're so short duration a degree of um, spectral splatter in the, in the, uh, therefore there might be um, a, a wide range of activity on, on the basilar membrane and then the same applies to um, for example more recent stimuli such as the uh, Klaus Elberling chirp the broadband chirp of course is deliberately designed again to activate a wide range on the basilar membrane um, but even to some extent the narrowband chirps um, still activate a relatively wide range compared with pure tone um, stimuli that we use in pure tone audiometry so for this reason we measure the RML not for a narrowband um, masking sound like in pure tone audiometry but for a broadband sig signal and what they did was they just presented both either with inserts or the super or headphone they presented the um, the ABR stimuli at a comfortable volume and then they um, presented a, a masker stimuli a broadband masker and they just gradually increased the level of the masker until the um, the ABR stimuli could no longer be detected by these people by these participants and so now they now know the relationship between the um, the masker level needed to mask uh, the the different types of stimulus. That's the that's the RML. That's what that gives us. Here's what they found. Um, again, just for those uh, those stimuli here, the the tone pip stimuli and the click, they found that um, broadly similar the RML between the two different types of um, he uh, headphone, um, and uh, some slight differences according to the um, you know according to the stimulus type, but somewhere. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, these are the mean values that I'm displaying here, but we can also see the range shown in the table at the bottom. But at least on mean value somewhere um, between you know 20 and um, and 30 dB SPL. So the masker is calibrated in SPL because it's a wideband masker. Okay, so with this information in mind, let's move on to thinking about some of the procedures how to implement this information. So now we know. Um, how to set the masker noise up to uh, um, completely mask the stimulus as it might have crossed over in, um, in, in, in the ABR. So to set the masker noise up in SPL we, ne we simply know the, the stimulus in the, in the, te the non-test ear, the sound level in the non-test ear and then add on the relevant um, relative masker level for the, uh, for the type of stimulus that we're using. And we know what the relative masker level is because we just showed it but there's a problem in fact with this this simple equation there is a problem in that we don't know there's no actual way to know directly what the stimulus in level in the non-test ear actually is we can't find that information out instead what we have to do is calculate it and we can calculate that because we know what the stimulus level was in the test ear and we also know from studies such as the Munro and Agnew study that I described earlier what the interaural attenuation is. So if we take the stimuli in the test ear and subtract the interaural attenuation we know what the stimuli must have been in the non-test ear. And so we use these three components um, to set up the level of masker noise when there's a risk of, of cross-hearing. Now I will introduce to you now a, uh, a resource that is widely used in the UK and uh, it's um, available to use elsewhere in other regions as well and it's a, a masking calculator and it's simply a, um, a spreadsheet that was produced by, um, by Lightfoot and is available to, um, to download via this, uh, via this website here if you're not already using it and the masking calculator at its heart simply has these three components in it that we that we have just uh, talked about so the stimulus level in the um, test ear the interval attenuation and the relative masker level for the type of stimulus that we're using 
and so if you were to look at the uh, masking calculator then you would see the equation in there as I'm showing here and those are the three components there that correspond to the um, to the equation that I've just described. Now you can also see that there are other uh, other components in the equation as well, which I'll just take some time to to unpack for you. But by using this uh, masking calculator, we don't have to therefore um, work out for each and every patient um, the you know the individual values. They're already provided for us um, in in the, in the masking calculator. All we need to do is um, put in the individual details for that patient. So uh, just to unpack those other components for you, so um, we've described uh, to, to, to a large extent the, um, the interaural attenuation and, um, and other calibration factors that are relevant for an adult. But there are various correction factors that you might require for an infant. And of course, if we're talking about um, estimating threshold with the auditory brainstem response, then it's infants that would be the primary target audience. So um, first of all, this uh, dB age, and this is a correction factor that's required when you use um, an insert headphone um, and also a, a bone conductor for, for an infant, which is slightly, uh, there's a, a slightly different um, intensity levels that can be generated. And that's the same when the stimulus is presented via an insert. But over here, it also is relevant when the masking level itself is provided by an insert as opposed to um, a super oral headphone. Then um, we have this ABG non-test ear, that's air bone gap non-test ear. So if there's an air bone gap in the non-test ear, then the masker sound will be slightly less effective. So we need to increase the uh, masker level um, to overcome that air bone gap before it then is effective in the cochlea. So we need to know what the air bone gap is. Quite often in infants we don't know and we have to guess. And a rule of thumb, if you think there's an air bone gap but you don't know what the size of it is, then pragmatically um, take 30 dB. And then finally, this is a calibration um, correction according to the um, specific type of um, uh, uh, white wideband noise that you're using and how it's calibrated. So in, it's calibrated in uh, SPL, but there's no um, agreed format uh, for, for how um, white noise should be calibrated. There's no universal method. So different manufacturers of ABR equipment will use or may use slightly different methods. And so I'm going to just briefly talk about that for the uh, Eclipse, the Intraacoustics Eclipse device. So um, age correction for interaural attenuation in infants is the first one. Um, just to unpack those points a little bit more. So here we have the uh, schematic of the cranium and the skull for an adult. And as I mentioned earlier, all the plates of the cranium are fused together so that vibrations can easily pass um, from across different regions of the skull and be detected by both cochlea. But in an infant, as we can see here um, in, the, in the lower schematic, there are gaps. The, the, the plates of the cranium are not fused yet. These gaps are filled by uh, a cartilage, cartilage fibrous, um, fibrous uh, tissue. And um, what, that, what they allow is they allow the plates of the cranium to move and slide around as the infant is passing through the very narrow um, birth canal um, of, of the mother. Of course, we're um, primates, bipedal primates with a relatively uh, narrow birth canal and so we've evolved in such a way that the cranium can um, squish and move around as it passes through the, the cranium, uh, through, through the birth canal. And what this means is that because the plates of the uh, cranium are not fused, that, ha that doesn't happen until um, you know, later on, then the, um, the interaural attenuation is higher for an infant. It's harder for the sound vibrations to pass across the skull. So the, um, a there's an age correction whereby it works in our favour in that there's somewhat less of a need for, for masking due, due to this effect. Interaural attenuation is greater. And I'm uh, displaying that on, on this slide here, so you can see as we move from left to right, newborns up to adulthood, um, the um, ap approximate developmental um, trajectory of the uh, fusion of the plates of the cranium, so that gradually um, over time the interval attenuation uh, value drops. And it's thought to be around 20 dB higher in a newborn compared with an adult. So um, we uh, in, in the interval attenuation uh, value, um, in the equation here, then that needs to be um, age specific and for a newborn we'd add on around 20 dB to those values um, described by uh, Munro and Agnew earlier. So interval attenuation reduces with, with age. 
And then in terms of the um, age uh, correction for the insert um, headphones, that's both the, the stimulus presented to the test ear and the masking presented to the non-test ear, then we have a slightly higher uh, value in infants than adults. This is sometimes described as the uh, uplift that you get in infants. And it's because of the relatively smaller residual ear canal volume that you get. And it's particularly the case for um, inserts, although it would happen to a smaller extent with super oral headphones as well, um, because of this, just because of the smaller size dif uh, difference in the, in the uh, infants compared with the adults. So the, uh, the inserts are uh, calibrated with a 2cc coupler, and that's meant to represent approximately the um, residual ear canal volume of an adult but an infant is um, a lot less so there's this smaller residual ear canal volume which gets gradually uh, um, larger until it get, until it resembles adulthood until it resembles that 2cc coupler uh, value and so um, there needs to be a correction factor because the actual SPL for this smaller volume here compared with this larger volume here, um, the SPL value down here would be a lot higher than what we might have calibrated it to. So we have to correct for that. And then the same, of course, in the, in the non-test here for the masking signal. Um, we have a, also a correction factor if you're using BC, um, which also uh, is taken into account in this component of the equation here. And that's because of um, going back to the separation of the um, bones in the cranium. So I'll just draw your attention to the adult um, schematic over here. And we have the bone conductor. The bone conductor is placed on the mastoid. And um, the energy is re required um, needs to vib uh, becomes to vibrate all of the, all of the cranium um, here because all the bones are fused. So it's relatively heavy, the head. Um, because it's bigger in the first place, but also because all of the cranium is involved in, in the adult. Over here, when it comes to a newborn, um, so first of all, physically, the size of the head is smaller. But secondly, the bone conductor is only vibrating this cranium here primarily. The vibrations over here in these other craniums that are not fused yet, these other plates, is a lot less. So the force um, that can be generated in this cranium here, this, this plate of the cranium here, is a lot higher so you get an uplift in BC and I think that's around I believe that's around 6 dB um, in, in infants as well so that that um, that that is taken into account in this component of the of the equation and then I'll just briefly mention finally the uh, correction factor for the noise calibration so I mentioned that there's no uh, standardized way to calibrate um, white noise uh, it's calibrated in peak equivalent SPL in the eclipse and what we would do for an insert we would use a 2cc coupler um, and we would use uh, an, an ear a simulator and then we'd um, compare the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the peak equivalent using an oscilloscope, um, the, 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 the peak to peak amplitude of the noise compared with the peak to peak amplitude of a one kilohertz um, reference tone. And in that way we can calibrate peak equivalent sound pressure level. Um, but I said there's no standardized way, so in, in the intraacoustics um, approach, we use the couplers with the ear simulator, but it would be equally, um, the, that's the artificial ear here, but it would be equally valid to do it with just the 2cc coupler without the ear simulator. And there would be no, um, no, 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 you know, there's no, no difference in the, in the validity of those two approaches, but they would give you different answers. And so up, up here in the, um, in the equation, we have to take into consideration the manu manufacturer specific approach for calibrating the masking noise. That's the, uh, that's, the, that's the equation unpacked. And now by way of an example, I'd like to just um, go through uh, the masking procedures themselves. Um, so this is, um, this, this is an example of a, 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 hopefully a typical example, a two month old infant. Um, and it might be referred by a newborn hearing screening program, this infant, um, for a follow up, including the ABR. And in this case, the, um, the reason for referral for follow up is that um, although we had a well baby, the, the OAEs were present on the left but absent on the right. So we have a suspicion of unilateral uh, hearing loss and the, the right is the suspect here. Now in this particular example, there's no other relevant medical or family or audiological history to, to be concerned of. Um, and so we can um, uh, we can we can proceed with the with the auditory um, with the auditory brainstem response testing. Now, if you have um, a suspect here of the right, then typically an audiologist would actually start on the left, 
and um, you'd confirm um, you, you'd first of all your primary uh, objective would be to confirm um, uh, good hearing on the left but before moving on to to the right and um, it would be pretty typical I think to start with a, a four kilohertz uh, stimulus um, and so it might be in the interacoustics eclipse device a uh, four kilohertz um, narrowband chirp so here's what we found so I'll just draw your attention to the left since that was the starting ear um, so we found um, in this case and uh, this is in DB NHL um, a, a threshold of uh, 20 DB NHL for a 4 kilohertz um, chirp so the true threshold in the behavioral threshold is of course likely to be um, well within the normal range we don't know exactly what it is we might even assume that it was um, normal since there was no other family history or other relevant audiological history but the ABR threshold um, is 20 dB NHL on the left. Now we uh, switch to the results that we found on the right. Now this was the side, this was the suspect here because we had no OAEs and um, it might be uh, typical to start at a moderate level but here we see um, uh, no, no response, a response absent, a flat line here so we'll gradually increase the sound level. Um, you might uh, initially increase in steps of um, 20 but if you consider the possibility of cochlear recruitment um, then uh, if, if that sound did become audible then it might become audible re relatively quickly and run the risk of waking up the sleeping child so um, smaller increments in step sizes might be um, necessary at, at higher intensities but we can see in this example that there was actually a flat line at 60 as well 70 dB NHL nothing at 80 but something of a, of a response, a small but clear response at 85 dB NHL. Now for an insert, that you, you wouldn't go any higher than this uh, for an infant because of the um, uplift that I mentioned earlier. So 85 dB NHL is actually um, much higher than that in SPR at the, at the eardrum. But um, nevertheless, we can see a clear response. The problem is we might not be sure at this um, particular point where, whether that response is arising from the right ear or is it in fact a shadow of the left ear and this this does impact um, in both in terms of the way you might debrief the parents of any type of hearing loss and of course um, your diagnosis of the hearing loss and, and potentially the management as well so it's important we get this right so what we'd do is so we'd switch to our masking calculator and um, we plumb in the information that I described so we we know that we have to um, explain the, the specific manufacturer and that's important for the, the way in which the masking noise is calibrated so if um, so, so the masking calculator is itself is not um, a manufacturer specific tool it works for different manufacturers but we've specified that today we're using the interacoustics eclipse and we've specified the type of transducer that we're using because we know that there's a uh, calibration uh, correction factors for those transducers. The stimulus type was the 4 kilohertz chirp. It was a two month old child so the corrected age falls within this group here, six to eight weeks. And the, um, the, the, uh, the, the, the hearing threshold in the non-test ear, the left ear, needs to be specified. So we had, um, although we've only tested by AC at the moment, we had an NHL value of 20 um, dB NHL on the left so that would be an EHL value of 15 and the test ear stimulus was 85 so um, with all this information the uh, masking calculator will plumb all that information into the equation for us and it will tell us that yes indeed there was a risk of cross hearing a small but clear risk and masking was needed and it also goes on to tell us exactly how much masking stimuli was needed so it tells us that we needed 50 dB SPL of masking or you could say um, you know, if you if you if you're stimulating at 85 dB NHL, then an offset of 35 dB to give you the 50 dB of um, in in SPL. Now in the Eclipse, we uh, the, the ABR module works in terms of a masking offset. So um, we take the stimulus level in the test ear and we apply the offset that the masking calculator gives us to reach the SPL value for masking wideband masking in the in the non-test ear. So um, just to uh, be clear on exactly how to do that so we'd come to the uh, temporary protocol setup screen and you'd refer to this re this um, area of the screen here and we're testing by AC insert phones and we'd simply use this drop down menu here normally that's set to off so there's no masking required but when masking is required we'd 
use this drop down menu and we'd select in this example uh, 35 dB offset so that when we uh, went back and we tested the right ear that there'd be a 35 dB offset of masking presented to the left ear. And now in this example this is what happens so now the, the left ear is masked out and then what you would do is you'd come back and you'd come to the right ear and retest at the same at the same intensity on the right ear, and that's what we've done. So the grayed out uh, value is the um, is is the previous the not masked uh, uh, ABR threshold, and we can see the the wave five there. But now that we're masking the left ear, um, we can see that the uh, there's a, now a flat line. So now we've gone to response absent. And then that tells us that, in fact, this wave five, the grayed out one that we had with the not mass threshold, was in fact um, a, sh a shadow of the, of the left ear. So provisionally, in this example, we actually, according to our AC values, we actually have a very severe uh, hearing loss, and, and potentially even a profound hearing loss in, in, in the right ear. Um, now, that's not the end of the story. This is obviously quite an extreme example because it's by air conduction. And thankfully, in infants, you don't need to mask very often when you use inserts because of the high interaural attenuation that you get with an insert, which is boosted even more due to the fact that you're, you, that you're testing with an infant and the infants themselves also have a high interaural attenuation. So the need for masking with AC, um, with, with air conduction, is relatively infrequent um, with, with infants. but. Um, but of course with bone conduction it's a different story and the, the need for masking might be much more frequent. So what I'm going to do is now is I'm just going to extend this example just to cover what might happen with bone conduction. So this is the same patient and um, we've gone on because we had that hearing loss on the right ear by AC then the next step might be to measure the thresholds on that, on that right ear by BC to work out is it a sensory neural loss is it a mixed loss or is it a conductive loss? So I'm displaying the, the thresholds on the left ear as before and now I'm displaying on the right ear the thresholds that we got in this patient by bone conduction. So we saw that at 20 dB NHL there was a flat line, there was no, no response um, present for 20 dB but when we got to 30 dB we, we see here that a threshold appeared and then uh, it gradually increased in its amplitude and uh, the latencies of the wave 5 got earlier so it's uh, um, a, a, a clear wave 5 there uh, as low as 30 dB NHL for the, for the right ear but because hearing on the left ear is so good we still aren't necessarily confident that these, um, these responses are clearly originating from the right ear it might be that the, uh, the responses that we're recording from the right ear are detected by the left ear so masking might be required so we had the 30 dB um, NHL, that was where the threshold was, the not mass threshold. So we pop that information once again into the masking calculator, so it's much the same as before, we've got the uh, manufacturer um, is specified here. Now the stimulus has been pre presented by BC, so we specify that here. All the other information is similar to before and the stimulus level accordingly is, is 30 dB NHL. All that information is plumbed into the masking calculator for us and indeed we, ca we can see that in this example there was indeed a risk of cross hearing in that that response at 30 may well have been detected by the left ear and to prevent that from happening we need to mask out the left ear with an offset for this stimulus level of plus 15 dB. And I'll just go on, I'll just say that the, the risk of cross hearing was even greater for the 40 dB uh, stimulus um, and for the 50 dB stimulus that we had, bone conduction not masked, there was a, a very high risk of cross hearing, a very high risk indeed. So what you might do in this case is, um, again, you might switch to your uh, temporary protocol setup screen and apply the level of masking that the masking calculator specifies. So here we have uh, bone conduction, uh, bone, bone, stimula bone stimulator here, with the masking specified as being presented by insert headphones. Of course, if you're, if you're masking using a super oral headphone, then you'd have super oral there and you would have adjusted your masking calculator accordingly. And then you use the offset that the masking calculator uh, provides for you 
to present the masking um, to the, to the non-test ear accordingly. And here's what we found in this example. So with masking um, presented to the non-test ear, the left ear, so now we have, uh, let's go for 30 first of all, now we have uh, no response present at 30. So the response that we saw previously here, this greyed out one, that was indeed a, um, a shadow curve of the left ear and there's no response at 30 with masking present. Now we see, we do now see a response at, at 40, but previously that response, the greyed out one, previously that was dominated by the left ear. And now with the left ear eliminated due to the use of the masking, now we can see that the true threshold of the right ear is actually um, at 40. And similarly, um, uh, up here at 50, we see that the response, the genuine response from the right ear is uh, small but present and it's slightly earlier in latency and larger in amplitude. Than, than before. So now we've, we've um, eliminated the, uh, the contribution, if you like, or the contamination, you might say, of the left ear on the responses from the right. So now we can be clearly sure that um, the response with the use of masking um, originates only from the right ear. So now the clinical picture in this example is very uh, different with the use of masking than what we might have imagined it, it could have been without the use of masking. And so we've reconstructed the audiogram and it looks something like this with the use of masking on the left ear. This is um, threshold plotted in dB NHL. And so the threshold on the left ear by AC was 20 dB NHL. By right ear, it was at least 85. And, um, and, and, uh, and with a bone conductive value of, of 40 dB um, NHL. Now, um, what you would, of course, go on to do um, in, in, a, in an infant now is you would go on to complete the audiogram at the other frequencies, and then you would apply the relevant dB NHL to EHL correction factors um, to, to, to then um, decide what the appropriate course of, of management was. Okay, so that's um, one example. Um, hopefully, it covers um, many different scenarios that you may come across in, in practice. It's perhaps not always able to cover every different individual scenario, but of course I'd invite um, questions and, um, and case studies of anyone who, who does have any, um, uh, have any interesting cases that they'd like to unpack further. But I'll just, um, I'll just go on to uh, mention a few things in summary now. So um, what's um, provided by the uh, uh, guidelines in the UK newborn hearing screening program is um, just a few rules of thumb to tell you exactly um, when masking might be required. So if there's an interoral asymmetry um, by AC of 65 dB NHL or more, then you might think that there's a risk of masking and you, you, at that point you'd switch to your masking calculator and, and start to decide if uh, masking was required. By bone conduction, um, the, 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 um, the, the, the number is slightly different. It's a 15 dB um, NH, uh, EHL, I beg your pardon. I'll just go on again to mention uh, cross uh, masking and the masking dilemma, which is a, a complication again. So as well as stimuli presented to the test ear, standing the possibility of crossing over to the non-test ear. So the same thing can happen with masking provided to the non-test ear. It stands a chance if you increase the masker level high enough of crossing over and masking the test ear. And then that gets you into the masking dilemma, whereby when you accidentally mask the test ear inadvertently, then um, what can happen is you then therefore need to increase the sound level in the test ear for that to be heard. That requires therefore more masking in the non-test ear and then and so on and so on. And this is typically uh, considered a risk when there's, um, in particular, when there's a, a bilateral conductive. So if you do your tympanometry, um, or there's other reasons to suspect that there might be a bilateral conductive uh, loss, then then uh, the masking dilemma needs to be um, needs to be taken into consideration. And there's no way to break the masking dilemma, but there are some ways to be aware of when it might be happening. So for instance, um, one of the huge advantages of the um, Eclipse system is that it's actually a two-channel system. Um, what you can do is you can, uh, you can switch to, um, to have a look at the response in the contralateral channel. And in particular, you would do this with, with BC, with bone-conducted um, ABR. And if cross-hearing is occurring in this case, then in the contralateral channel, you would expect a wave one to be present. Whereas if cross hearing wasn't occurring, then no wave one should be present. And another advantage of the Eclipse system is that it has the chirp stimulus and then the chirps um, 
because the uh, chirps produce a high degree of neural synchronicity, then the waveform morphology is generally uh, better with the chirp than it might be with um, other traditional types of stimuli, such as the um, uh, such as the, the narrowband uh, tone pips. So um, you stand a better chance of observing the wave one when you use the chirp in the contralateral channel if, if it's being cross-heard. Um, another thing to, to consider is that, again, just to improve the morphology of the um, waveform, is that you could use uh, a slightly slower repetition rate. So typically, for reasons of um, speed, you might consider somewhere maybe 40 um, uh, repetitions a second. But for deciding if wave one is present, you might slow that down to, say, 20. A second um, thing that you can do is you can you can compare the amplitude and latency of wave five between the contralateral and ipsilateral channels. And if it was um, earlier in the contralateral channel than the ipsilateral channel and the amplitude greater, then again that might give you an indication that uh, sound was being cross-heard. Um, just to, again, just a few closing statements as I'm aware that uh, time is rapidly uh, running away from me. So um, the reason why we use um, uh, masking with um, broadband noise in the ABR is that we use these short duration stimuli that are calibrated in dB NHL and much the same principles although the masking calculator was designed for the ABR in mind much the same principles apply with the auditory steady state response um, so that's a slightly different type of evoke potential but some of you may also be interested in masking with cortical auditory evoke potentials now in here, in the cortical auditory evoke potential, we'd use a slightly longer duration stimuli that's calibrated in dBHL. So it might look in schematic something like this, compared with the tone pips or the chirps or the click in the ABR. So with the short duration broadband stimuli that we use in the ABR, we need to use a wide band masking signal and it's calibrated in dBSPL. But with the long duration stimuli that we use in cortical auditory evoke potentials, that they are very highly frequency specific. So now, when we um, when we have a look at the activation pattern um, in the uh, cochlea on for the for the cortical evoke potentials, then we'd expect um, a much narrower activation pattern. So now we can use the narrowband stimuli that we might use in standard behavioral pure tone audiometry that can be calibrated in in dB NH, in, in dB HL. And the easiest way to provide this information, if you're using cortical evoke potentials, um, since the Eclipse is designed to um, use masking with wide noise masking, then the easiest uh, source to get um, a masking stimuli that's narrowband, one third octave wide and calibrated in HL, would simply be to use um, a masker provided by a separate system, an, an audiometer. Okay, so... Um, that brings me to the end of my talk. Thank you so much for your um, continued attention. Um, if anyone is interested in further details, then here's some interesting references that you might follow up on. Um, but of course, um, we'd, al we'd always invite um, questions. Um, and uh, here's, here's our email address. I will also make myself available for any, uh, any questions online, um, if anyone has any. But thank you again for your attention.